you still get it. It's still being shoved at you. We are so enamored with postmodernism in our workplace, in our occupations. It's so easy for it to become the way in which we operate our own spiritual person. And that is a much greater concern to me than what's going on in America. Woodrow Kroll has written this, when the church becomes an entertainment center, Bible literacy is usually an early casualty. People go away from the event with a smile on their face, but a void in their life. Folks, that describes what so many are attempting to do religiously today that it's not funny. We want people to have a smile on their face, but individuals leave with an emptiness in their life. Why? Because if, if the new is not anchored to anchor points of the old, all it brings is chaos. Can the church do new things? Can the church be involved in things that are new? Absolutely. Had we? Should we? We had better be. But we had also better maintain that there are anchor points that we can never let go of. Let me illustrate this. Here is how this postmodern philosophy works on us. All of the sudden, certain activities that at one time would never even be considered by those who proclaim to be believers, certain activities are engaged in knowing full well that Jesus could never accompany me in that activity. I mean, we know that. But the postmodern philosophies get us to the point of denying that. It was nigh on to 15 years ago, Mandy's first day at East High School. She came home and she was impressed with all of the kids wearing bracelets that said W. W-J-D, which stood for, what would Jesus do? Boy, that's, that's one powerful question. The credo today that is now infiltrating into even places that say they believe in the Bible as the standard for governing their individual lives, the credo now is J. W M H. You don't know what that means because I just made it up. <laughs> but here's what it stands for Jesus wants me happy. That's, that's the postmodern interpretation of Scripture. Jesus wants me happy. My kids can watch as friends of theirs end their marriage. Christian friends end their marriage. Not based upon what would Jesus do, but Jesus wants me happy. And people aren't afraid to proclaim that. Jesus wants me happy. How should we worship? Oh, here's the credo. Jesus wants me happy. You see, postmodernism begins to affect how we view the standard of Scripture. You know what? Jesus really doesn't want you happy. Jesus wants me holy. That's what Jesus wants. And if I'm holy, guess what? I am happy. Let me show you some other ways. 
we know that certain attitudes, that if they become embedded in my heart, that they are wrong. The scripture tells me I should not unite myself with such attitudes. But again, it's postmodern thinking, by the way, which I pointed out last week, which is really not anything to do with modern. It has to do with humanism that began with Adam and Eve. But it's, that's what we're calling it today. It is that postmodern thinking that leads me to believe I can somehow sidestep the power, the truthfulness of that scripture. It may apply to somebody else, but it doesn't apply to me. Let me just illustrate in a very safe way. There is very little in this world that does not happen to saved people that also doesn't happen in the lives of people that aren't saved. And if I respond to those situations in my life the same way as an unsaved person responds to it in their life, playing the victim role because of all this terribleness that has come into my life, what standard am I following? What am I doing to the points of Scripture that Jesus says, all you who are weary and heavy laden, bring, come to me and I'll give you rest. What am I doing to the Scripture that says, do all things without grumbling or complaining? What am I doing to the Scriptures that say, rejoice always and again I say rejoice? Oh, Dan, you just don't understand. You don't under... Oh. It's not me that doesn't understand. It's the book that says this is the anchor point to suffering Christians. I'm supposed to be different than the world around me. But our postmodern way of interpreting Scripture is leading many believers down the road that we have just as much right to whine about our circumstance of life as does anybody else. What has God, have we so cheapened the grace of God? Lack of personal sacrifice. We talked this morning in the parenting class about self-esteem and what our world has proclaimed as the great, great need for all parents to make sure that their kids are, have a high esteem of themselves. And we talked about the, the true dangers in that, in that thinking and in that philosophy. Scripture proclaims that personal self-sacrifice is not an option. It is the way of being a Christian. That's what scripture identifies. It's not, yeah, I'm supposed to, I might. It is to be the fashion in which we live. But again, it is postmodernism and the roots of postmodernism that work upon us and say, yeah, but. This is a new time and we've got to have new things for a new time. Okay, fine. But whatever is new needs to be anchored to something that's true and right. And so, spiritual things are not all about me. A successful worship time is determined by my level of satisfaction. Did I get anything out of it? Did it encourage me? Did it uplift me? That's, that's, again, that's postmodernism at work. Because what is the purpose, what is the anchor point of worship? Why did you come here this morning? If you open up the Bible, why did you come here this morning? You came here this morning to humble yourself. You came here this morning to empty yourself. And the way in which you came here to do that was to praise God, was to remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And any other motivation is not biblical. It's not biblical. It's not about me. It's supposed to be all about him. But again, postmodernism is affecting how we look at Scripture. The devil has propagated such thinking about, uh, about the Lord's kingdom for centuries, if not millennia. We find over and over that these things have been present. As our society sinks deeper into the roots of postmodernism, uh, we find that it's becoming easier and simpler for our believers today to use similar rationale. The ambiance of a spiritual safety is always jeopardized when the sense of right is reduced to human rationale. I want you to catch that. That's the point of today's lesson. If we're trying to create a safe place, it's not going to be by me determining what's right. If we're going to have a safe place where we're 
all together in safety. It's not going to be when Brett gets to decide what's right. And it's not going to be what Dan gets to decide is right. If we're going to have a safe place, it's because we come in the constant belief that somebody else has built the, 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 the points, the anchor points. Someone else has said what's right. Oh, does that mean we all agree 100% on everything? Absolutely not, but we agree on who has set the anchor points and what those anchor points are. The dysfunction and corruption of that rationale intensifies its power in destroying the church's positive energy. It always has and it always will. I love this. Moses gave this particular instruction before any of the events happened. He is talking about God's going to take these people. He's going to take them to a, to, a, to a land. He's going to allow them to possess that land. They're going to build a place in that land where they can worship God. And here's what he says. You shall not do at all what we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. There's going to come a time when you're God's people living in God's land and in God's nation that it's no longer going to be up to you. You know, that's just exactly a foreshadowing of what God intended to happen under the person of Jesus. The difference is the promised land is the individual heart that Jesus has come in to rule, and you and I are not to be doing what is right in our own eyes. But it didn't stop there. You'll remember during the time of the judges, you remember why things got in such great turmoil during those times? It's recorded for us in Judges chapter 17 and verse 6. In those days there was no king. In Israel every man did what was right in his own eyes. David wrote that those who, uh, who, who think it is their right to say anything they wish, he said this, May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and every boastful tongue that says we will triumph with our tongues. We own our lips. Who is our master? 